everyone. So this week we are going to be introduced to seven new fallacies. I know it sounds like a lot, um, but you don't have to know them all completely this week, so you will survive. And um, we're also going to talk about some from chapter six that you didn't know that you knew, because this week you are supposed to read chapter six, the last chapter we have to read in Asking the Right Questions, and it is the chapter on logical fallacies. So, first let's go over some old fallacies by a new name. The book mentions the ad hominem fallacy, which is just a fancy name for personal attack. So we're mostly using personal attack because it's easier to remember. Also, the book talks about appeal to popularity, though there's a slight difference. Basically, this is similar enough that we're just doing appeal to common opinion. So if common opinion is your reason to believe something, then that is the same kind of the same fallacy as believing something because it's popular, okay? Um, then again, just a slight difference in terminology. The book says appeal to questionable authority. In our wiki, we have appeal to irrelevant authority. Why would I use something different than the book? It's because you're also going to be reading about these fallacies in a different text to review them, and they use slightly different names because, unfortunately, this is not standardized. <laughs> And so I had to pick one name or the other. So I picked the one that I thought was most revealing of the actual meaning of the fallacy. And next we have yet another name for black and white thinking. They call it either or. This is the same as false dilemma, making it seem like there's only two choices and black and white thinking, which I think you all really understand by now. So those are ones we already knew, okay? And there's a couple in the book that we're just not doing because we can't do all the fallacies in the world because then the test would be like on 50 instead of on 23, which is actually going to be. And so we are doing these fallacies this week, begging the question, moving the goalposts, overgeneralization, sometimes called hasty generalization, red herring, searching for the perfect solution, slippery slope, and the straw man, or as some people are calling it so as not to be um, gender-biased straw person. The first thing to know is don't panic, okay? I know it's a lot of fallacies. You're going to get them all between this week and next week. But this is just an introduction. You don't know, need to know them well until the test at the end of the semester. And the test is going to be open book, something you do at home. So... Don't panic. You're going to learn all the remaining fallacies this week and next week, but that just gives us two whole weeks to focus on nothing except reviewing all the fallacies and learning to apply them to more and more situations. Since on the test, even though it is open book, you will have to apply your understanding to examples you've never seen. All right, so where can you find out about these fallacies? Well, you can find out about these fallacies yep, the exact same place you've always been able to find out about them, which is Blackboard. So let's um, bring me onto your screen so you have something moving to look at. And let's go to Logical Fallacies. Okay, you can get there through Logical Fallacies or Wikis. Logical Fallacies. We forgot to tell me to float on top. And you can pick the fallacy wiki. Okay, let's bring me back. All right, so we now have in the wiki all of the fallacies we've done before and all of the new ones we are doing now. So let's just have class and let's go do them in the new ones in alphabetical order. Okay, um, first let's tell me to stay looking at you. Okay, there we go. All right, so the first one is begging the question, and it might be the hardest one to grasp, but we will just go alphabetical. Let's see if we can make this bigger for you. Hmm, that was only partially successful. Let's take this away. Oh yeah, all right. 
So the definition of begging the question is, in formal logic speak, assuming the premise, the premise is your claim, in the conclusion. Okay, so now let me tell you that in normal person speak. You're restating the claim instead of giving reasons to prove it. You're just saying the same thing twice. Begging the question is basically saying the same things twice with different wording and pretending that's proof. So, examples. I love my new iPhone because it's so awesome. Basically, you're saying, I love it because I love it. You're not saying why. Okay? Of course, you can say this anytime, but you can't say it about something that's, you know, life or death importance to our nation because it's not actually giving a reason. So you can't use that kind of circular reasoning. Begging the question is also called circular reasoning. Okay? Because you're just using the first thing again as the proof. You're using the conclusion as the proof. Okay. I know he's lying because when he talks, I can tell he's lying. Again, you're saying the same thing. I can tell he's lying twice with different words. So he might be lying, but you haven't given us any proof. Communism is a bad idea because Russia was bad when it was communist. There's some circular reasoning our country bought into 100%. Okay. <laughs> if you go back far enough in history. My horse weighs 500 pounds, and I know it because my scale is accurate. Accurate. I calibrated it by weighing my horse. So he set the scale so the horse would be 500 pounds and then used that as the proof that the horse is 500 pounds. No, it's circular reasoning. Okay, so that is begging the question. Okay, and I, I've been told, I've learned online, that begging the question is actually a mistranslation of a Latin phrase for this fallacy, um, but it happens to be what we call it in English. Okay, so begging the question, mostly saying the same thing twice and pretending that's proof. Now we're going to go to moving the goalposts. So you need two people talking for moving the goalposts. Because moving the goalposts is when you're having a conversation and one person keeps changing the evidence needed for the other side to win until the argument is inarguable, until it's impossible to prove. So the idea that you have the goalposts you need to make and you keep moving them farther and farther and farther and farther away until they would be impossible for anyone to get to. Okay. Um, there is a good little two, three minute video on this one. There is on all of them. Okay. Which is optional for you to watch. And I really suggest that you do uh, at some point before the test when you have time, you know, have a whole three minute explanation of them all. All right. Examples. Global warming is a fake. We have evidence proving that it isn't. Show me evidence from the actual climate. All the hurricanes that are so much more frequent now. Okay, but show me evidence there were never this many hurricanes in the history of the Earth. Well, obviously that's a standard of proof that could never be met. So person one has been moving the goalposts, okay? First, they just wanted evidence. And then when shown some evidence, they wanted evidence from today's climate. And then when shown evidence from today's climate, they wanted evidence from the entire history of the earth, which you can't meet. So they've made me, you know, kicking your ball through the goalposts impossible. Okay, let's try it again. The rich should be taxed more. How would that help the economy? They get more money and it will help the government pay for social programs. But that wouldn't eliminate all poverty. So here we have person two moving the goalposts. Okay. First, they just want to know a reason why it would help the economy. Okay. And then this is a student made one. So I know they get more money is a little bit confusing. The government gets more money. Okay. And then they want proof that it would eliminate all poverty. Okay, which is an impossible standard to meet, which overlaps a little bit with one of our other fallacies. All right, these, by the way, are all student examples from me doing this exercise in class with last term's class. Okay, let's go on to overgeneralization. Now you might know this word, 
And it means exactly what you would think it would mean. Overgeneralization, also sometimes called hasty generalization, hasty means too fast, is making a judgment based on too few examples and included in this is stereotyping, okay? So when it's about people, we often call it stereotyping, but hasty generalization or overgeneralization can also be about things, and we don't tend to call it stereotyping when you're talking about shoes. So here's some examples. I had a student from Norway who was super smart, so all Norwegians are super smart. Yeah, the first half of that sentence is true. The second half is an overgeneralization. My roommate from Australia loved Vegemite, so all Australians love Vegemite. Okay, possibly true, but your roommate from Australia loving it is not enough evidence to prove that everyone does. Okay. My Adidas shoes broke quickly, so Adidas shoes don't last. So here's one where it's not exactly stereotyping because it's about shoes. Okay, maybe they broke quickly because you hiked 100 miles a day in them, and maybe different models of Adidas shoes are more meant for more walking than others. So it's an overgeneralization um, because the fact that one pair wasn't bad doesn't mean all of them from the company are bad, and we don't know anything about how they were used. Um, here's one that's actually been in the newspaper, if you're reading the certain newspapers. A woman in Texas was murdered by an immigrant, so we shouldn't let anyone in this country. We can thank our president for that over the generalization. Okay, World War II helped the economy, so let's have another war. Yeah, I think it's an overgeneralization to say that wars are good because World War II provided a boost from the economy. Even though World War II did help end the Great Depression, okay, it's an overgeneralization to then decide that, you know, wars are something we should have. All right. Next up, we have the red herring, also a, um, a phrase you might have heard before. So I hear that this is called a red herring fallacy because in the old days when people were teaching their dogs to hunt, they would use smelly fish, red herrings, okay, to try to distract them from the scent. And so a red herring became synonymous with a distraction. You don't really need to know that though. You just need to know what a red herring is. So it is a fallacy where an irrelevant topic, a distraction, is introduced into an argument to divert the attention of the listeners or readers from the original issue. So red herring is one of the first fallacies we've had, but not the last, that is a way of not answering the question. Okay? Um, and when you watch political candidates debate, you see them use the fallacies that involve <laughs> avoiding answering the question all the time. And uh, eventually we will even practice that with some SNL fake debates. Okay. So a red having is a distraction that helps you change the topic and not answer the question. So here's one. Mother, why didn't you tell me you went out with your friends last night? Son. I'm 16 years old. Shouldn't I be allowed to do things by myself? Well, yes, maybe you should, but that doesn't answer the question of why didn't you say you were going out with your friends? Okay, that's the question the mother asked, and he didn't give any answer. Uh, I thought you might say no. Uh, we were doing something we weren't supposed to, or I don't like to talk to you. No. <laughs> Whatever the answer is, or I wanted some privacy. <laughs> Whatever the answer is, um, it, it is of why he didn't tell his mother. It was not, shouldn't I be allowed to do things by myself? That's a distraction, okay? He's trying to make the conversation about something else, his independence. Okay, example two. Counselor, <clears throat> why have you been so stressed out lately? Student, you're not the boss of me. You don't observe everything I do, so why do you care? Okay, another example of these are personal examples of when we use red herring fallacy of instead of answering the question of kind of, this is almost a personal attack, red herring of turning the question back on the um, questioner. Here's one that's more like what you might hear in the news. Moderator, should we make college free? Candidate, 
Let's talk about the candidates who suggested that. I hear that so-and-so is under investigation for... (laughs) So the candidate has completely refused to answer the question, probably because he or she thinks the answer would be unpopular and instead is moving on to attacking the other candidates who suggested that, okay? Not every red herring is a personal attack, even though I see that our examples are very much like that. Um, A red herring can simply be a change of topic, okay? Let's talk about what's really important, which is something other than what was actually asked. All right. Searching for a perfect solution. So searching for a perfect solution is falsely assuming that because a solution isn't perfect, it shouldn't be tried. So it's the kind of argument that says if we can't fix the whole problem, let's not fix it at all. Okay? This kind of reasoning is used a ton. It was the basis of the entire campaign against Obamacare. When Obamacare was up before Congress, the entire TV ad campaign was based on searching for a perfect solution. This isn't going to help. It's not very popular to say, we don't want you to have health care. We want you to suffer and die. So instead, the ad campaign said, Obamacare is not going to help every single person, so let's not do it. Okay. Which, of course, is a problem because it still might be better to help some people than to help no one. Okay. Examples. Why would people want to put money into educating prisoners? Some of the criminals that come out of prison change their lives because they received an education, but some don't. Okay, again, it's asking, if we can't fix it all, let's fix nothing. Okay. We shouldn't have a disciplinary code. Not everyone needs it. We already talked about Obamacare. Okay. Rehab centers don't fully help everyone, so I'm not going to try it, even though I have a drug problem. So, searching for the perfect solution is an excuse, okay? It's an excuse to do nothing, because the suggested solution won't fix everything. So, I had a real, actual conversation with someone who came to my door in February to convince me to vote against a local housing project and used this fallacy exactly. So I looked at the flyer that she handed me a flyer that said, vote no. And so that we didn't have a half hour conversation, I started off with, just so you know, there's nothing you could say that will convince me to vote no. I really believe we need more affordable housing here in Newton. And affordable housing in this context means um, designated low-income housing, uh, where the town fixes the price of the apartments at a lower rate, and only people who make in the bottom 25% of the income of the town can apply for those apartments. Okay. So the woman surprises me by saying, I care about affordable housing too. Okay, I think... But this development will have 800 units of affordable housing. So how can you vote no? If you care about affordable housing, this would create 800 more affordable apartments. And she says to me, it's not enough. So vote no. And I was shocked into silence by the lack of logic and thinking, searching for a perfect solution fallacy. She thinks because 800 units of affordable housing is not going to fix the entire problem, we should build none instead, which helps exactly no one. Or she didn't think this at all, and what she was really thinking is, I don't want to live across the street from the type of people who are going to be in that affordable housing. But she didn't want to say that, because no one wants to say that that's their real reason. Okay? Um... So instead, she she fell back on the searching for a perfect solution fallacy. She agreed with me. Affordable housing was something we super needed. But since 800 wasn't enough, we should say no to this deal and do nothing and leave it empty parking lots and brick buildings with broken windows, which is actually what the area in question is at the moment. All right. So people do use these, and they use these in politics, both national and local, and they use these as personal excuses, too. Um, just two more. We've got the slippery slope fallacy. 
The slippery slope fallacy is when you argue that one small action leads to a set of more significant consequences, becoming more improbable at each step, like a domino effect. Okay, um, I had a therapist once who called this catastrophic thinking. Okay, so examples. I failed the test, so I'll fail the class, so I'll fail out of college. These things kind of need an exclamation point over them. I made a campaign speech, and people like this speech and will vote for me. So now I'll become president after one speech. Okay, you can't tell. Slippery soap is a, assuming the consequences are going to fall like dominoes. Okay, when you don't really have proof that that's going to happen, it's just speculation on your part. It's just guessing. If we have free tuition, taxes will skyrocket, the economy will collapse, and we'll have another Great Depression. Slippery slope. Because we took this one little step, we're going to go down and down and down and down and down, mostly to disaster. I put one positive one here, but slippery slope is mostly leading to disaster. And last but not least, I kind of think we may have watched this because it came with another one, a little video, but didn't add it to our fallacies, it's the straw man fallacy. So the straw man fallacy is when you misrepresent the opponent's argument as something more extreme, so it's easier to argue against. Note that in all these examples, the second person restates the first person's argument, but wrong, okay? So that's how you can tell it's a straw man argument and not just kind of a personal attack. It's a type of personal attack is that it involves restating the first person's argument, but more extreme, not exactly what they said. Okay. Ed, my history textbook is so slow, I hate reading it. Ted, what? You're never going to read anything again? How will you get an education? You'll be ignorant for the rest of your life. Okay, Ed didn't actually say he was never going to read anything again. He was just um, a little bit bored with his history textbook. So Ted restated his argument, but more extreme. Flora, I think we should require a mental health exam before someone buys a gun. Dora, you're going to take away everyone's guns? That's unconstitutional. People have a right to hunt if they want to. Well, Flora didn't say she was going to take away everyone's gun. Okay, that's a more extreme version. Billy. Be sure to stay six feet away from everyone on your walk. Oops, little typo there. And wear your mask. We're going to assume Billy's the dad. Lily. Now you're not even letting me out of the house? You're the worst dad ever. Okay, so of course dad didn't say she didn't have to leave the house. He just said if she was going to leave the house, she had to wear her mask. Okay. But in typical teenage fashion, Lily is making this about something much more extreme than what Billy actually said. Okay. A, a ton of this reminds me of um, this straw man argument type. Reminds me of the kinds of arguments that parents and children do have all the time. When a child is so upset at the parent putting a condition Okay, that they make the argument into something much huger than it was actually about in the beginning. All right. So, I think we can make, we can hide me. Because um, I'm in the way of PowerPoint. Uh, quick time. View. We're not going to float on top. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we're not going to panic. So why are we learning these fallacies anyway? Just a small note before we go. Well, there's two main reasons. Number one is so no one can trick you into agreeing with positions that actually contradict your values. So, for example, the person who came to my house. It would contradict my value of diversity where I live to not build low-income housing. <laughs> but she was trying to convince me that my value actually said we shouldn't build it because it wasn't enough. Okay. So it's not that I'm trying to change what you believe. It's just I'm trying to make you impervious to being tricked okay, into thinking people agree with you when they actually don't. 
And the other is, of course, so you can make logical arguments when you stand up for what you believe. Okay, because especially in your academic writing, logical arguments are valued. We can talk about what's valued in the media, which is not always logical arguments. <laughs> but you do want to have the capacity to make them both in your academic career and in the way you talk to people who you care about. Because we usually assume the people we care about are intelligent enough to respond to logical arguments and not to these fallacies that we see in political type ads. Critical thinkers, in general, are not sheep. No. Okay. They don't follow blindly. They evaluate arguments and then decide whether they agree with them or not. And that is what we want you to be, critical thinkers who analyze the argument and then decide whether you agree with it, who are not led around on some leash and you don't follow the bellwether like sheep do, which is the popular sheep. That's why sheep are considered followers, because sheep actually follow around a certain sheep called the bellwether, who is the popular sheep, and they just follow that sheep wherever it goes. Okay. We don't want you to be sheep, even though this is a very cute sheep. We want you to think for yourself and not be tricked. And that concludes today's presentation.